Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard. This is the day two here at the sixth edition of the International Flight Safety Seminar for the CAAs and operators. Well, my name is Shin Ji Ye, and I've been serving as the host following yesterday. Well, thank you for joining us both on and offline. Yes, we are currently uh, well streaming live our um, conference through our YouTube channel of IFSSCO in two separate channels in Korean and in English. Today we are to welcome designated speakers to deliver their insights in two sessions. Session four, new training methods for flight safety enhancement, and session five, aviation safety management in APEC region. Well, at the end of the session, we're going to open the floor to welcome uh, questions. Well, online participants, do not feel left out as we have indicated the uh, Q&A link for you at the YouTube channel. So if you have any questions, you can submit your question through the link that we have attached. And we are um, paperless seminar, which means that we're providing all the uh, presentation materials only in a PDF form. You can either scan the QR code at the back of your name tag or refer to our website. Having given all the information, I think we're ready to kick off the session four, new training methods for flight safety enhancement. I can see that the moderators and the speakers are ready to take off. So I'm going to pass on the mic to our moderator for the session, Commissioner Jun Su Park of Air Navigation Commission of AKL, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Jun Su Park. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Korean Office of Civil Aviation for the giving me uh, this opportunity uh, as the moderator for the, this uh, previous event today. And also, I'd like to extend uh, my uh, uh, appreciation to the, all the participants, participants on today here, and also moderated the speakers who joined us today to move uh, way forward for the global aviation safety today. Uh, session four will really delve into the cutting edge training methodology at the board during uh, flight safety. And ICAO has uh, played a crucial role in the aviation industry by establishing uh, training policy and uh, uh, developing international standards and the recommended practice called the SAPS. Uh, these initiatives are aimed at enhancing the safety, efficiency, and harmonization of the civil aviation operation worldwide. In this regard, Korea has uh, certainly benefited the international cooperation and assistance on aviation training. Uh, here, I would like to uh, introduce uh, a little bit sad, but uh, happy ending story of the Korean aviation training uh, before we cut to the chase. The Republic of Korea uh, became the ICAO member state on December 11, 1952, during the period of the, uh, when the entire country was engulfed in the Korean War, which persisted from the 1950 to 1953. In September 1952, the Korean government decided to become the member state of the ICAO, but due to the prevailing circumstance at the time, uh, it was unable to dispatch delegation to the ICAO assembly. Therefore, the consulate officers from the New York consulate office attended the assembly as a representative to the ICAO. So during his assembly, you can see uh, the pictures on there I found in the ICAO library a few years ago. So during the assembly, the uh, announced, uh, announced was made by the Korean government to the, will join the ICAO and uh, honestly sought technical assistance, including the comprehensive training uh, from the global community. Once the work ends, then uh, to enable Korea to contribute to the development of the international aviation industry. At the end of the Korean War, with the general support for the numerous nations, Korea was achieved its uh, present day aviation prowess and has played the independence indispensable role within the international aviation community. Now, back to the, our point. Uh, over the past three years, our world has endured unprecedented challenge of the global pandemic, and now we are in the process of recovery. 
In the face of these profound changes and emerging challenges, which include the rise of innovative players like uh, the new entrant, like uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and also we, need to, we have urgent needs to address climate change and emissions, and uh, also the rapid phase of the digital transformation. Uh, it's uh, imperative to re-envision the new aviation training systems to fast growth and uh, facilitate adaptations. The time to embark on this transformative journey is now. To that end, today's agenda features several uh, very noteworthy presentations. We will begin the, our uh, ECAO's safety training sport and encompassing the topics such as uh, competence-based training and assessment of CBTA and comprehensive ECAO training portfolio and the crucial role of training in supporting state needs for the COVID-19 recovery. This will be followed by the insightful presentation on the FAA's advanced qualification program, as well as the JAA's uh, pioneering effort in virtual classroom learning to meet, it, uh, to meet the demand of the new normal year, including the on the job training. Additionally, we have had a very privilege of the delving into the world of data, uh, data driven based uh, high efficiency training for the new generation and the utilization of a mixed reality training, leading to our receiving valuable insight and positive feedback. So it's time to start our journey with the first presentation, ICAO safety training support by the Dr. Laura, uh, sorry, I practiced before, but uh, I forgot again. So Laura Camastra, uh, Dr. Laura Camastra, Chief of the ICAO training, TCB of the ICAO. So she is uh, uh, lead and direct the implementation of the ICAO's global aviation uh, training policy. Thank you. Please welcome Laura uh, Camastra. Thank you and good morning, everyone. If you could please, please put my presentation on. Thank you. So ICAO's training uh, development guide, document 9914, competency-based training methodology is the foundation of ICAO training. This methodology is used by ICAO to develop ICAO training packages in line with the ICAO provisions. And it's used by over 100 training centers uh, recognized in the Trainer Plus program of ICAO to develop standardized training packages in line with national regulations. This methodology is also used to provide capacity building and competency development capabilities for course developers, course instructors, and training center managers. A traditional training is more focused on meeting and maintaining qualification requirements and standards, whereas competency-based training courses are designed to ensure that trainees demonstrate the necessary competencies required to carry out assigned duties and responsibilities. Competency-based training and assessment, CBTA, was introduced into Annex 1 in 2006 with Amendment 167 when the Council of ICAO adopted the standards for the multi-crew license MPL. It is also PANS training, so generic methodology for all aviation disciplines, adapted competency model, and observable behaviors. So what's next? Since then, there has been some progress incorporating CBTA in the license domain. However, the major developments have been in maintaining pilot qualifications, such as guidance on evidence-based training and upset recovery. There have been some further developments. Council recently adopted full CBTA SARPs, Standards and Recommended Practices, in ARPAS license standards and the Personnel Training and Licensing Panel, PTLP is looking also at expanding the use of CBTA in the licensing domain. That said, it took a stepped approach to bring CBTA to other domains in aviation. 
Amendments 5 and 7 introduced a methodology to incorporate CBTA for all discipl disciplines covered by Annex 1. It introduced the adapted competency model and introduced the concept of assessing experience through observable behaviors instead of a prescriptive number of hours. Guidance has been published for several disciplines like air traffic controllers, maintenance, flight dispatchers, cabin crew, and air traffic safety electronic personnel. The future of evolution of licensing SARPs is expanding the use of CBTA across all licensing domains. It becomes, however, challenging for civil aviation authorities at times to implement this. So this is where the Capacity Development and Implementation Bureau can support. Today, thanks to the collaborative work of the Trainer Plus network and training partners, ICAO's portfolio of courses and programs continue to expand. We have a portfolio close to 400 training packages, catering the needs of civil aviation training worldwide, spread across 10 strategic areas, as you can see here, and navigation, aviation management, aerodromes, and others. These are some of the highlights of the courses and programs in ICAO training portfolio that are relevant, relevant to today's discussions and are available to all member states. As you can see, we have courses on flight safety and safety management, ICAO government safety inspector courses, so certification of personnel licensing, operations, airworthiness, and air cargo, global ACI ICAO airport safety professional designation program, two dangerous goods program, one ICAO using the technical instructions for the safe transport of dangerous goods by air, and another one in collaboration with FIATA, the Freight Forwarders International Association. Safety management training courses also for the different safety management roles each professional is performing at state level. So safety management, safety management for practitioner, state safety program, national aviation safety plan. We also have ICAO English Language Proficiency Interlocutor Rater Initial Training. And this uh, brings me to the last part of my presentation, which is the uh, ICAO way of supporting state needs, especially regarding the recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic. So at the onset of the pandemic, ICAO training immediately embraced digitalization and evolved from face-to-face -face classroom training deliveries to virtual deliveries which are inst still instructor-led, and also the development of short accessible online courses which are self-paced. As a result, today member states can access more than 100 ICAO training courses available in virtual classroom and online format, making remote learning much more accessible and affordable as well. Another innovative concept introduced by ICAO at the onset of the pandemic is the ICAO implementation packages, or so-called IPACs. These packages are provided in a seamless manner to states and include five elements. Subject matter expertise, guidance material, standardized training, tools, including data-driven applications, and procurement guidance where applicable. They are focused on a single subject, and their duration is of short intervention between three and six months. As of today, more than 100 states are benefiting from IPACs. And as you can see here, there are some examples related to the topic of today, aviation safety risk management, establishing a regulatory framework for the unmanned aircraft system, the developing a national aviation safety plan, preparing ICAO USOAP, CMA activities, and finally, improving the quality of NOTAM for safe flight operations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Uh, it was a good presentation uh, we see uh, today. ICAO has, uh, you know, the ICAO has a uh, substantial works for the global aviation, and I believe that we can talk about it later. But uh, one thing uh, before we move to the next guest is, you know, that is uh, for the, as, uh, you know, just for your information, I'd like to clarify this one here. So TCB was uh, renamed, right? Yeah, she works for the uh, Technical Cooperation Bureau of the ICAO, 
and uh, TCB was uh, the name of the TCB has been renamed uh, on the, a few days ago in the event of the GISS 2023. So we can celebrate this one later. So thank you very much, and uh, we'd like to uh, move to the next uh, speaker. So we can take advantage of, a, of a sufficient time here. So I'd like to uh, introduce him very uh, detail, more de with more details. So Mr. Robert uh, Leckert for the FAS training program, uh, including the advanced qualification program. So he is the manage, manager of the AFS, to, uh, AFS 200, the air transportation division, uh, which is part of the Office of Safety Standard within the Flight Standard Service and the FAA. Uh, Mr. Robert Rackett has the, also served as the Acting Deputy Director for the Air Carrier Safety Assurance and as the AFS 600 uh, uh, Regulatory Support Division Manager. Uh, Robert is retired from the United States Army and served in various positions as a standardization instructor pilot and maintenance test pilot. He also served in the U.S. forces in Korea two times in the 1990s, and uh, so also he's a uh, third visit to Korea here. So please uh, welcome Mr. Robert Rackard. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I'm so I'm joined online virtually by Mr. Ben Lafargue. Um, ben is our manager um, and our, quite uh, frankly, our subject matter expert um, on advanced qualification programs. So although we're going to get into the, the slides, um, if uh, there are any questions um, after when we get into the panel or uh, later today and there, there's something that I can't answer, Ben is uh, here monitoring and is here as a resource if we want to dive into any of the, uh, the technical pieces um, around uh, the advanced qualification program, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the emerging technologies and what we're doing um, within the flight standard service um, around virtual reality and other simulation um, technologies that are coming towards us. So with that, um, every good organization has a business plan, right? So our organization that we work for within the Flight Standard Service, the Office of Aviation Safety, our business plan is and part of our goals, right, are to safety or, or safety related and primarily focused on reducing aviation related fatalities and serious, in, serious injuries. Why is this important? Training is the front arm of prevention of, of accidents, incidents, damage, all those, all those things that we don't want to happen all begin with, with properly training, training our, our employees. What is AQP? AQP to us in the, the flight and within the FAA is the Advanced Qualification Program. A lot of terms get mixed um, when we talk about uh, advanced qualification programs and competency-based training. And I'd like to just highlight that comp for, from our perspective, Competency-based training and assessment is a very broad umbrella um, of vocational type training concepts that is spread across multiple domains and industries, right? The aviation industry is not the only industry that focuses on competency-based training. Um, it has various labels. The label that we put on this type of competency-based training is the Advanced Qualification Program. A little bit of the nuance um, in that is that our Advanced Qualification Program focuses on proficiency or airman proficiency versus competency. But as far as AQP specifically, it is a process-oriented methodology for developing and delivering and evaluating training. The AQP program is based on certification of the airman is, or, or the crew member is based on a series of validation and evaluation gates um, within the program. Systems validations, procedures validations, maneuver validation, line operational ex evaluation and experience, then operating experience, and finally uh, the line check. Each validation point and gate is a data collection point. Um, for surveillance data by not only us as the regulatory agency, but also for the air carrier that participates uh, with the AQP program. It is worth noting um, within our regulatory structure, an AQP program is a voluntary safety program for an air carrier. Our part 121 rules contain uh, two appendices. We refer to them as N and O, uh, part 121 N and O, where your traditional uh, training program requirements um, that would be codified within a regulation um, 
why, but that AQP is another um, uh, option available for an air carrier. And as we move through the slides, you'll see that the adoption rate um, is, pr is pretty significant. The current AQP landscape for, for the Federal Aviation Administration is that we have 90% of our flight crews, uh, the front end of the aircraft, right? Those flight crews, are their air carriers have an AQP program. And we currently have 70% of our cabin crew flight training programs um, have an AQP program. Where are we seeing AQP expansion? Um, largely within the cabin safety programs. Um, we do have three new entrants into the pilot program. Um, pilot not as in new, but just for pilots, right? I think I made that uh, distinction a little bit yesterday. Just wanted to make sure it was clear going the other way. But we have three new entrants um, that have taken on incorporating an AQP program uh, within their air carrier. Um, but we are seeing significant growth in cabin safety programs. And we even have an air carrier that now has an AQP program for their dispatchers. So we're uh, seeing a lot of growth and em embrace of, the, of these programs. Um, one of the examples I like when I, th when I think about the value of AQP in cabin safety programs kind of drives on the competency versus proficiency model. When you think about the tasks that we train um, flight attendants or flight crew to, for example, conducting CPR using an a uh, AED or an automated uh, defibrillator, right? Having pr competency with that piece of equipment is different than the proficiency required to be able to use that equipment in flight. And so many of our AQP programs have cabin simulators. And so instead of the, the flight crew, for example, demonstrating proficiency in using an AED, they have a, 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 a dummy, if you will, right, in the window seat that's probably the size of me that they have to pull out of the chair, right, place in the aisle and then be able to conduct those tasks in the aisle of the aircraft, right? That's very different than on a table or in, a, or in that academic environment. And we think really improves, um, improves safety within an organization. Like most programs, uh, Successful programs are a lot of times based on or supported by data. And for our AQP programs, many of these programs, uh, or all of the programs that are on the slide, support that AQP program and that closed loop of continuous improvement within the advanced qualification program. And there are many programs that many of you probably have with your air carriers as well. For example, FOQA data, the flight operations quality assurance and the oversight there, line observation data, um, ASAP data, voluntary reporting systems, um, from our perspective in the FAA um, are one of the most powerful tools um, that we have to, to evaluate culture um, and, and, and the safety culture and uh, effectiveness, I think would be the right word of the carriers programs. Um, if with, without those voluntary safety programs, I think that's uh, the, the, the model or the four pillars of, of the safety management system really are, aren't, aren't effective. Obviously, within any training program, we have our learn, learning management, and then obviously um, surveying and closing, closing the loop um, with the crew. Why AQP? Why AQP? It's a win-win for the FAA and the certificate holder. This provides a, an opportunity for the certificate holder to, to validate training, increase safety, leverages the resources and talents of the certificate holders. It allows the air carrier to develop and, and the FAA to, to, to evaluate um, their, their training and processes. The, it allows the air carrier to align training to, the, to their needs. If you think about the umbrella of, of scheduled, for example, part 121 operations, that's, that's it. for us in the United States, that's the gamut of uh, the Uniteds and Deltas of the world to, to FedEx and UPS to small supplemental Part 121 air carriers that are operating legacy aircraft, right? It's scalable, tailorable cargo passengers, combi aircraft, et cetera. It's scalable, tailorable um, to the operations. It integrates data and supports safe oper operations and, and enables, um, enables safety within the carrier. All right, probably the thing that everybody was waiting to hear about, I guess, or I hope, because this is a pretty exciting area for us um, within the FAA is emerging technologies. We're spending a lot of time, effort, and resources in researching and learning 
um, about the new emerging technologies in the space of simulation. Um, from our perspective, what we're doing is we're kind of categorizing those, those um, emerging technologies into three categories, virtual reality, mixed reality, and augmented reality um, training, and they all have a pr place within the umbrella of the learning experience um, for, for the crew member or the person being trained. What we're trying to do from a very strategic level is change the landscape of how we look at simulation. Today, we have basic training devices and advanced aviation training devices, or what we would consider level one through four devices. And then we have level five devices all the way through level D devices. What we're trying to do is change how we look at what, change how we look at the spectrum of simulation. And rather, rather than defining what a device can do, defining what device is necessary for the task that needs to be conducted. Um, today, we, we very much compartmentalize um, our basic uh, and advanced training devices, and then we compartmentalize our, our, our um, simulation devices that can be used for training, qualification, credit, et cetera. Rather than that, that internal ba barrier between those devices, what we're trying to do is essentially create another, another way to explain it would be a simulation spectrum. Everything from the procedures training to the level D device is a spectrum, very similar to the safety continuum, right, of complexity and what the device can be used for. And rather than focusing on the device and what the device um, is authorized to do, we're trying to change and look at that differently and ask ourselves, here's the task that needs to be conducted. What type of device do we need to conduct that task? Um, and are hoping that with the uh, introduction of the new technologies, um, we'll be able to um, see that vision through and be able to enhance safety by creating more proficient airmen. Um, I think when you, when you look at an air carrier's uh, training program, there are many things that are uh, bottlenecks in the training program, right? Obviously, flight time in the aircraft is expensive, right? So we want proficient airmen before we place them in the aircraft. Level D devices are very expensive. Right? And I think everybody would acknowledge that most level D devices operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, right? Very expensive to operate, very expensive to maintain, very expensive to train our train pilots in. Can we bring that pilot and put that pilot in the level D device with a higher level of proficiency so that the time in the level device is, is less? These are the conversations that we're having internally about how we can leverage virtual reality in that, in that simulation spectrum. Virtual reality. I don't know, anybody else's kids have one of those virtual reality headsets and they run around uh, I see some people smiling. Was my, my son got me to try it. It's a little bit interesting and a little bit different, but it's very traditional virtual reality. You have a headset, you have two controllers in your hands, and you move through the, you move through the game. Mixed reality is the same type of headset, um, but what there, there's external um, cameras involved that actually see your hands and then create virtual images of your hands within the display. And then an augmented reality system, you could think of that as maybe more of a pre-flight um, type system where you could wear the virtual reality goggles, walk around the aircraft, look into the landing, the landing bay, see your hands, but then things would pop up and explain what, what different you know, components are, et cetera. So just trying to break down the, the different devices that we're seeing um, within the FAA. Very important distinction that we're talking a lot about is simulation versus simulators. Um, and and it, we need to be very intentional in the words we pick and choose when we're establishing the distinction between VR devices about what simulates a task versus what is a simulator. So for example, in the pilot training environment, everybody's, most, most people are probably familiar with concepts like pictorial pre-flights, right? where instead of going out and training um, how to conduct a pre-flight on the aircraft, there's some sort of PowerPoint presentation, uh, materials, other things you look at, right, to train the crew on how to do the pre-flight. Um, great example of where our current policy and rules allow an air carrier to, to supplement or even replace that training, uh, that training with virtual reality, because that's not a simulator, that's 
a just a, a it's a simulate it's not simulating a task it's just providing an alternative means to be able to conduct that that same task the same way as uh, for example pictorial pre-flight training um, is being conducted when we talk about simulators um, and using uh, a virtual reality device for pilot training or other other training then now we're talking about that simulation um, spectrum from the level one device through the level D device and we do have air carriers today with um, under, under our umbrella within the FAA that are starting to um, use virtual reality within their training. From a from a organizational perspective, we are very much trying to embrace a crawl, walk, run um, strategy when it comes to virtual reality. This is new technology. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the investments we've made um, in learning about uh, learning about this technology and establishing standards um, and how we're going to qualify them. But again, we want to crawl, walk, run, and, and learn um, as we go through. We're currently evaluating a VR simulator built by Loft Dynamics uh, to, to determine what level of qualification is appropriate for that device, part 60 being the benchmark. Um, and that part 60, our part 60, which is how we qualify simulators, um, establishes the criteria for what those devices need to, need to do. Um, but that, but the, the rule is very, very specific and very technical. Fortunately, when that rule was co codified within the FAA, there's some deviation authority um, built into the rule. And our intent is to not lower the bar, but just look at how somebody else could, could meet that same standard just from a different perspective using a different type of device. If you're not familiar um, with the Loft Dynamics, uh, the FAA has purchased two uh, Loft Dynamics virtual reality simulators and has had them installed at our um, uh, William J. Hughes Technical Center, which is in Atlantic City. If you don't know where Atlantic City, New Jersey, it's just outside New York City, and it's one of our areas where we do a bunch of, bunch of research. But we've purchased a Robinson R22 and an Airbus uh, or H-125, otherwise known as an AS-350A star helicopter simulator. Uh, these simulators have motion, um, virtual reality. They have a, a, a cockpit simulation station, et cetera. Um, and we're working with our senior tech, uh, technical scientists um, and our staff that qualifies simulators. And we're actively um, moving and working collaboratively with Loft Dynamics to evaluate their simulators um, and evaluate um, uh, the qualifications and standards uh, of those simulators to help inform uh, our standards moving forward. And with that, I think we're okay and we'll uh, um, look forward to questions. And if, uh, if there isn't time, please, I'm here all day. I'm happy to talk through uh, any, any of these subjects, um, whether it's AQP, simulation, VR, virtual reality with anybody um, that has an interest. So thank you for the time. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, this, this presentation was the, <clears throat> is the opportunity to understanding the FAA's uh, advanced qualification programs, which is comprehensive training initiative designed to enhance the skill and proficiency of the aviation training. It was very interesting on that. So I'd like to move on to the next uh, speaker. So is a, next is a, is a training in the new normal of the the uh, Joint Aviation Authority Training Organization by the Eric uh, Shandwood. So Mr. Uh, Eric is the business uh, strategist and the relationship manager and responsible for the course the development unit at the JAA training organization since to January 2017. Uh, in his role as business strategist, Eric is playing a leading role the development of the JEA, the, the training organizations uh, mid and the long-term strategy and the implementation within the organization. It's, a, it's a, in his professional life, of the Eric has more than 30 years of experience in the various sales, marketing, and the management role, including the earlier function in the field of training. Now, uh, please welcome Mr. Eric Shandor. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, good morning, Friday morning, just for the weekend. 
I had a wonderful week here in uh, South Korea, in Seoul, since Monday, participating in the GIS. I see some familiar faces also welcome uh, this Friday. Um, yeah, I was invited uh, to provide a presentation and the topic, training in the new normal, new technologies, etc. I start with a very, very brief introduction of the JA training organization, for who is not familiar with, with our organization. Uh, more than 50 years ago, the JEA was founded by a few major European NEAs, working together on civil aviation rules in Europe, following by the first training courses in the 90s. A milestone in Europe was the European Commission basic regulation in 2002, which led to the establishment of the European Safety Agency, that is EASA. An important change to the JEA rules was that the EASA rules became mandatory in Europe. That is the big difference between the old JEA and EASA. Finally, with the establishment of EASA, all rulemaking activities of the JEA gradually were transferred to EASA and were completed in 2008. Training activities were not transferred to EASA, uh, but continued as the JEA training organization. Don't mix up the old JEA with the JEA training organization. We have the same history, but we split our ways in 2009. And at that time, uh, we continued as a non-profit organization, uh, but as an associated body to the European Civil Aviation Conference, a European organization supporting its 44 member states and be the center of expertise to them. We are the training arm. At this moment, we are an ICAO Platinum Training Center. Thanks to the presentation of Laura, we have already 12 years experience in the field of competency-based training courses and being a partner. We are an IATA Competency-Based Training Center of Excellence, an accredited ACI training partner. Also, RAMP Inspection, we are recognized, and we have a national recognition in the field of security and dangerous goods. Ending the introduction, based on our mission and vision, our main goal is to capacitate professionals and organizations with the highest quality learning and knowledge solutions. And I think this also fits in this presentation, uh, uh, the new normal competency-based training courses. Training in the new normal. Preparing this presentation on this topic, training in the new normal, I was thinking about the challenges we have been facing during the last few years. COVID-19 has impacted and affected our world. And we already realized during the pandemic that after the pandemic, this will be a new normal. It was spoken new normal and that became uh, a saying. We have seen in the meantime that also pandemic drives innovation, accelerated the adoption of new technologies and also the process of digitalization. Traditionally, JEA is a regulatory training school simulators, virtual reality, normally yeah, is not the way we are working on. We need to explain the regulation and how to use it in practice to make the professional competent to use the regulations. But also we have seen that new technologies in our field are very important. ICAO stated last year that recovery is fast approaching pre-pandemic levels. Some regions order faster than the other. IATA and ACI expect that we are back at 2019 level in 2024, and I understood from uh, during the last few days that for South Korea, the last year, 2022, was at 63% of 2090 levels, and South Korea expects to be back at 90% in 2023, that is this year. So I hope also that South Korea will be back in 2024 on previous level. Besides the recovery, we see that the aviation industry is constantly evolving and everybody working in the sector where safety and security are crucial must always be able to fulfill their assigned task and responsibility, and that in accordance with the most current regulations. That is why training and education is crucial for the sector. Most people in aviation have completed their education at school or university, but working in aviation, it needs additional training to be able to do their job. Therefore, they participate in additional training courses and recurrent courses to stay remain. A thing that is important for us to get and keep an adult workforce competent. It is important to understand that adults learn different than children. 
There are a lot of theories. I'm not going into depth. You can approach me in the break. But adult training is completely different than uh, educating children. We see that competency-based training is the standard in aviation nowadays. You saw it at the previous presentation from Laura and the FAA, CBTA is the word. We have, yeah, uh, our experience is also CBTA becomes the standard, not only from the stakeholders, but more and more we see also from our customers, from our partners, are you courses competency-based? We already saw that new technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, but also artificial intelligence right now is a hot topic. At this, at this moment, it's a lot of talks, but I, I expect it will be having a big impact on learning in the next period. As mentioned, COVID-19 has a major impact on the educational and training system. Also, we as GAA, we were forced online delivery immediately at the beginning of the pandemic. I will briefly present our experience, our journey during uh, the pandemic in changing from classroom training to virtual classroom training. For us, it started in March 2020. I remember it as the day of yesterday. At a certain moment, we need to close our office. Some participants were already in the Netherlands, or they were not able to travel, but courses need to be delivered uh, due to customer requirements. That is because uh, customers and participants need the required certifications. We were already thinking about future virtual delivery, but as always, uh, everything goes well. It is not a high priority, but at that time, in a few weeks, we were forced uh, to start virtual delivery, and we decided not to stop, but to continue with it. Um, we immediately start, and I say absolutely quick and dirty. The instructors were uh, at our training center. We put a camera in front of the instructor and start continuing training courses. But also that time, it came absolutely clear to us that delivering courses in a virtual environment is completely different than standing in front of the class. And that is what we have learned. And immediately after the first week, we start with what can we learn? What is the business case? What needs to improve? To explain, a virtual classroom is an online synchronous learning environment that allows for live interaction between instructors and learning. It's an instructor-led course, but using a virtual classroom tool. Um, a sidestep, we are talking about adult learning. There are two things uh, that is also important in aviation uh, in the career. We talk about lifelong learning and life-wide learning. To stay competent during the career, as earlier mentioned, don't only rely on your school or university. Working in aviation, that uh, requires specific competences due to changes of regulation. As a pilot, you can change the plane, uh, you can change job, you need to stay competent. Therefore, we talk about lifelong learning, lifelong learning. Yeah, I've put a quote. We have a lot of old instructors, and now I understand uh, that they want to continue learning until they are uh, yeah, above retiring, etc. Another thing that is not so known, life-wide training. What is life-wide training? Besides participants are training, uh, participating in training courses from time to time, uh, I call it intentional training. We learn each and every minute. Maybe we don't realize. Not, particip not by participating in a course, but by other topics. An example, when you have read a manual for new equipment and then use it in practice, you learn. Another thing, when you have a very bad experience, an accident or whatever, that can also change your mind and change your behavior. Also spending time to a hobby, you learn. So we talk about life-wide, lifelong training, and when it is adult, competency-based training is the standard. Um, then, going back to the virtual classroom, uh, some of our experience. What I mentioned already at the start, we start with what is the business model, etc., etc. Delivering a virtual classroom course, it came clear that it's not only using a virtual platform and delivering the classroom course with the existing content. It's completely different. The most triggering point was how to engage the participants. People can easily distract it. I can give an example. During the first few months, uh, our instructors uh, saw that strange behavior of a participant. At the beginning, we have said it is mandatory to turn on your camera because then we can see that you participate. 
but they are clever. There was once, in the beginning, a recorded session of five minutes, and it looks that he was participating. But his reaction was not good. I mention this because it is important that the instructor is skilled. He needs to recognize this behavior, ask proactive questions, etc. So he could take the participant aside, gave him a warning, and continue. That is just one example about a virtual classroom is completely different. Um, yeah, I said it's not only uploading the content, and that is a trap that many, many organizations can make, but all have made, just uploading the online content. The dynamics of a virtual classroom course is completely different. Content needs to be adapted. Uh, interactive elements, shorter sessions, etc., etc. It's a 2D environment instead of a 3D environment. Uh, distraction is more when you're sitting at home, your wife, we have seen that cats walking through uh, the camera, etc., etc. It's quite easy to be distracted, and as an instructor, you need to be prepared for that. Um, <clears throat> everything transferring a classroom course to a virtual classroom course or developing com a complete new virtual classroom group, it should not be underestimated. It also requires other skills. Our experience is that you can train an instructor who is a subject matters expert in this field in educational skills. You can learn how to use the virtual environment, but combining it, a virtual environment, all the skills, uh, engagement, and using, we are using Zoom, all the tools, together at the same time, it is difficult. I'm facing it by myself. I thought I was a Zoom expert, and then I need to give a training course. I was lost. This requires skills. And also, our experiences in the transfer of classroom courses to virtual classroom courses or develop virtual classroom courses, using the competency-based methodology, it is much more easier to develop courses or to transfer courses. This sheet shows a little, some difference between classroom and virtual classroom. I only mention a few. It looks an open door, but during a classroom course, you meet each other at the training center. The coffee machine, you have a talk with each other, talk with the instructor, and then you go to the classroom. In a virtual environment, you meet each other at the beginning of the course, having maybe difficulties with the technology, starting up, etc. So it's completely different. The restrictions I have also spoken about. Timetable, we have experienced that Keep a track on time is important. We see also that some training courses in a virtual environment needs more time instead of four days, five days. It's quite easy to lose time and have time shortage. Also, a disadvantage could be that online training has a lack of human interaction. It is less effective and less engaging. When I talk to professionals, and also our experience is that classroom courses face-to-face -face is the most effective and efficient training delivery. But sometimes, due to cost, et cetera, et cetera, it is important uh, to do it virtually. Then something about technology. What I mentioned, we are traditionally a regulatory training organization, but also new technology becomes absolutely important for us. Uh, What we see is that with all new technologies and needs, um, whether it is synchronous, asynchronous, physical online training, on-the-job training, uh, we see that it will be more and more becoming a blended solution, not only classroom, not only virtual, not only line. Depending on the situation and the professional and the request, we also see more and more that it becomes personal training, training targeted to the specific individual. We see that more and more with all new technologies and new methodologies, uh, a mix will be chosen. This sheet, uh, I just show some specific technology. For Zoom, I mentioned already, it's not only using the platform, but it is also using all the functionality, the video tools, screen sharing, a digital whiteboard used together with your trainees, the digital whiteboard, virtual breakout rooms, communication via chat box, etc. The, the Zoom platform 
also include possibilities for quizzes, polls, chat options. So there are a lot of tools to make a virtual course uh, uh, engageable uh, uh, and involve the trainees to the training course. Also, we see in general using videos, virtual reality, gamification, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, simulators. There are a lot of technologies we can use in the meantime. Um, a little bit more about artificial intelligence. Also, we as training organization, the last month, last half year, we are looking a little bit deeper in what our, our, our possibilities. And the first thought was, what can we do with artificial intelligence? But I think there are a lot of things. First of all, with the transfer to a virtual environment, we also make our examinations online. But then the question is, how to do the observation in an, uh, in an online Artificial intelligence has also the possibility in a creative way to do the observation without any involvement of staff. Um, also what we see is that artificial intelligence can help with creating question banks, uh, with cases, support, etc. We are developing online training courses, but we are thinking of using artificial intelligence for avatars and voiceovers. Uh, also, artificial intelligence can help to learn. I can give an example uh, within my family. It was two months ago, my son had difficulties with a specific formula on the university. And he's trying it with ChatGPT. He filled in the formula, and finally, he got some answers. Then you can do two things. You can put it in the exercise, send it to the university, or learn from it. He asked me, can you help me, please? So he used ChatGPT to have a faster understanding of the topic and then use it. When you use this kind of technologies in that way, then it will support and help you, not by copy-paste. Last week, I had also a discussion with a professor of a UK uh, uh, organization about what will be the impact. And it could be that the role of verbal examination, etc., is becoming a big role in the future, because students can use artificial intelligence for their exercises and uh, theses, uh, etc., and they can fill in. It is important to have an understanding that, is the student really competent to do their job? So that also requires a different way of assessment to avoid that artificial intelligence is used by students to make a nice Thesis, but don't have the real competencies. In my opinion, it will have a big impact. It has a lot of advantages, but it will change the way of thinking. Also, yeah, there are disadvantages, loss of expertise, and over rely on artificial intelligence. It could be when you trust, I heard it the last few days also, it could be a lack of decision in emerging and critical situations when you rely too much on artificial intelligence. Thanks, Laura, already for explaining the competency-based methodology that's on the below. We have already more than 12 years' experience in competency-based training and assessment. Uh, I'm not going into detail. Also, this, don't underestimate it. Uh, uh, the manual Laura shown, there is a 10-day course. It is standard for all our course developers to participate in that 10-day course. But only with the course, you're not there. You need practical experience to be an expert in competency-based training, how to use it, etc. I've seen it with my team. They have participated in the course, and when they develop the first course, they are facing a lot of difficulties to make it real competency-based training. When the training organization mentioned our training courses are competency-based, Ask a few questions more. Is it really competency-based? How are you doing, etc.? It's not easy. The most common methodology is ADI, that is on the top, but the ICAO methodology is, uh, is, is based on that general. And we have 12-year experience, and we can recommend it to all. Um, the last few sheets, you can read it on, on your own. Why competency-based training? Uh, people ask, uh, how competency-based training can differ from traditional training. Uh, this is, uh, these are five statements that I used from uh, the competency uh, group. Um, competency-based training focuses on the skills gap to become competent to fulfill the tasks. 
This with clear end of the course objectives based on training needs analysis and using the right training course. It is not just a lecture. CBTA is focused on performance required when participants return to the workplace. It's not only the classroom, but when you return to the workplace, they need to become competent. It's not, it is not just gaining knowledge. It's making them competent to fulfill their job. We also see that adult learners are responsible for their own decisions. And also, normally, adult learners know where they are learned for. So the motivation is different. I expect better. Competency-based training is not only for participants. It is also for organizations. It's not only the participant that needs to be competent. The organization needs to be competent. Therefore, more and more, we are also talking to our major customers. What are your training plans? What are your organizational goals? How can we contribute to it? We use competency-based training for standard training courses for larger groups, but it is also ideal for customized training to meet specific uh, requirements. That was my presentation. I think it will be distributed, so when there are any questions or whatever, please feel to approach me via the email address or LinkedIn or whatever. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Harry. Uh, it's a, a great time to see uh, the JAEA's training organization, including the training programs such as virtual classroom, lifelong, and the uh, life uh training. So I have a, it's a, actually the personal experience with the, <laughs> relating to the is a JAEA. But uh, when we opened the new Incheon Airport in the early 2000, uh, we tried to uh, introduce the, the all-weather operations, including the Cat 3 Alpha and Bravo operation into the Incheon Airport. But we faced uh, a lot of the, these uh, big challenges and issues at the time. Uh, however, the, by the, through the referencing to the JAA materials, I mean the guidance material leading to the uh, all-weather operation, we could make uh, a lot of achievement at the time. That's why uh, the, yeah, my feeling is different from the JAA. Very familiar with that. Thank you very much up there. <laughs> so next, uh, next uh, is uh, our last guest today is uh, Captain uh, Jose Fernandez, and uh, he would like to make a presentation to you uh, with the effective training for the aviation uh, personnel to cope uh, with the new normal. So he is currently the Assistant Director of the Flight Operations Safety and the Security in the Asia Pacific Office of International Air Transport Association, IATA, in Singapore. Uh, prior to work for the IATA, he was the Corporate uh, Safety and Quality Director of the Lion Air Group, an Indonesian airline holding, including the six airlines uh, in three different countries, uh, maintenance organization, uh, ground handling service uh, provider, and uh, one uh, training centers. So yeah, before he uh, joined the Lion Group, Captain Fernandez was the vice, vice president of the flight safety of the Iberia Airlines of the Spain after being appointed to some other positions as a operational flight safety manager and a MD-80 fleet manager and a human factor of safety manager and a check pilot and flight instructor. So please uh, welcome Captain Jose Fernandez and uh, Jose, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, let, me, <laughs> let me start uh, saying that I'm very pleased to be here personally, and thank you to the MOLI to invite Ayata to, to participate in the, in the symposium. So I will try to um, add something new to what my uh, predecessors in the podium uh, tried to explain about the new technologies. Uh, the IATA position, and also I would like to add some personal experience. As I've been said, I've been flight instructor for many years, and then I have to say that it was the most rewarding experience. Uh, I still have 
uh, a lot of uh, students that I keep contact with them. Or um, I've been also lecturer in the university, and uh, many students that I, I don't remember at all, they stop me in the street and they say, oh, you were my lecturer, I remember you. So it's very rewarding experience now. But uh, 20 years ago, uh, I, I, was, I moved to safety, and I fell in love with safety. And I decided that I, I, cannot, I cannot have two lovers. So I, I decided to move to safety and quality, and this is going to be my, my role in the last uh, 20 years. So uh, after the pandemic, the industry is facing a, a very severe skill shortage and uh, challenges in retaining and recruiting uh, staff, as, as, you, as you know. Many experienced skilled uh, employees have left the industry by many reasons that we were discussing uh, yesterday. Uh, we are now coming back to normal, right? Uh, recruit and train aviation staff needs uh, time. It's not something that we can do very easily. We need time. So it's critical to retain the 16 uh, staff and uh, find more and, uh, and efficient ways to on board new personnel. So this is uh, our ge uh, generations, the current generation. I'm a baby boomer. How many of you are baby boomers? Yeah, well, don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, most of you, you will be also a generator X, because uh, nowadays 60% of the workforce in the industry are baby boomers or uh, generator X. But you have to prepare to include new, new uh, genera generations in the, in the industry. So that's why probably the existing training system may not be able to meet the growing demand of the aviation industry unless we attract and integrate the and train, of course, the, uh, all the available talent and, uh, and including the new working generation. Generation S and, uh, uh, sorry, set and, and uh, Generation Y, also known as Millennia, will be the largest uh, workforce, labor workforce very soon. This is uh, some, something that is going to come in very soon. There are many uh, different behavioral uh, factors among uh, working generations. The new generation expect immediate feedback. They, uh, they have uh, short attention skills. They are 24 hours connected. They are very highly visual learners. They are digital native. So they, they was born with the computer, not like us, like the baby boomers. It's something that we need to, 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 to adapt. And uh, they rely on technology and also in automation. Uh, and then they are not frustrated. Uh, they don't have frustra frustrated feelings uh, when they cannot find an easy way to do things. They try. It's not like us, then including me, that uh, especially when we try to insist the old generations on interact with the system in a certain way without exploring other, other paths, that the new generation, they are more used to, to do that. The new generation are more flexible. They test and obtain, and obtain sorry, the desired results without getting frustrated along the way. Traditional lear, uh, learning system started to become obsolete for the new generation, and the results of, uh, is that our children obtain mastering in some devices that we will not obtain without going through uh, the same process. So we need to adapt our training process to them. An example for me, a clear example, is the way we proceed when we buy a new mobile phone or tablet. Nobody goes anymore through the manual, right? Everybody goes through the uh, new device, and we can wait using the, the device. And uh, so what we do is we uh, try to understand how it works. Right? So mm, many uh, aviation industry uh, stakeholders, they are aware about this, uh, this, this changes. So we, uh, we need 
to begin to study how to develop lending programs to allow the interaction with the machine without having uh, to study a large volume of information as uh, we used to do in the past. So, uh, as I, has been said, I, I'm a pilot. Um, I still have some of the manuals, and it's something like this, not like in, in, in the slide. This is something that is not going to be accepted by the new generation, so we need to find the way to integrate them in a, in, in a different way. The new normal will offer a um, wide range of uh, possibilities uh, offered by technology, as has been said by uh, a few minutes ago, to allow us to write an effective training using different paths. Not all the ways used to obtain the desired outcome might have the same level of safety. So it's necessary to know the risks associated with each of the technologies and offered by and the new training technologies. So we must be aware that there could be some induced risk. Here, uh, you have some of them, some of the risks and challenges that we will may face. And so we will lose, lose the new generation if we engage them with our boomer and generation X uh, attitudes or learning skill. To attract and retain young talent in, in aviation will be definitely more automated and more complex, but the integration of the new generation will add also complexity to, to, to the system. The intuitive learning process widely used by the new generation, which is basically based on trial and error, so that's the way uh, the, the new generation uh, learn using the trial and error principle, cause vertigo if we apply this learning technique in a passenger plane in flight. I don't want to be passenger on this, on this flight if, if we have a, a training of uh, trial and error. I don't know you, but uh, not, not, not me. So what is the, the IATA vision on, uh, on an effective training of aviation in the future will require the use of new technologies and based on competence, as I've been said uh, uh, already. So let me elaborate a little bit. So I'm not going to go into detail because we have had already many slides about competency-based training and uh, completion based on competence and not in hours, as has been uh, explained. Competency is manifest and observed through behaviors and uh, that mobilize relevant knowledge, skills, and attitude to carry out activities or tasks under specific conditions. In this slide, you uh, see what we propose uh, IATA as a, some of the skills for pilot competency. So you know, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into detail because, I mean, this is very specific for, for, for pilots. But IATA, we have a lot of data, as you know, and thanks to the airlines. So it's not our data, it's uh, our airlines all, all over the world, they share data with us. So one of our sources of information is our uh, IATA Oversight Safety Program, that is IOSA. Uh, many of you, you should be familiar with the program. The program is already 20 years, uh, run, run for 20 years. 2023 is the 20th anniversary of the program. So the IOSA program includes all IKO standards uh, relevant to airlines and uh, many industry recommended practices. And uh, we included many years ago, a AQP and a CBTA as an alternative method to uh, uh, establish an, a training program in an airline. What is the reality? What is the data is saying to us? Since the IATA program is in place, we never reach more than 18, 15, 18 percent of airlines complying with this kind of advanced training program. So, that means uh, we have our, around 410 airlines registered in IOSA worldwide in 132 countries. And uh, since the FAA said that in, in the U.S. approximately 90% of, of, the, of the operators, they al already use AQP or uh, CBTA program, that means that this is not a very well-established program all over the world. And we need to... Uh, wonder why, and then the why. In, in, uh, according with our analysis, 
uh, one of the difficulties that they are having to uh, uh, establish this program, especially the operator, is the lack of proper regulation. So this is the perfect forum where we are together, airlines and, uh, and regulators, to compromise that CBTA is the future and CBTA should, and the regulators and the state, they must establish the regulatory framework to allow the, the, the operators to move to a, a CBTA or AQB programs. So the second pillar in our uh, strategy, IATA strategy, is the use of new technologies as has been uh, already explained. So uh, the in Increasing complexity of, uh, of the aircraft and the airspace will demand new ways of training. That's, uh, that's clear. The use of, uh, so now we have, as has been also told by, by Robert, now we have to be focused that the use of data, especially and uh, the use of simulators nowadays, the simulator they are able to record data, they have telemetry included in the in, in, in the remit. So using these uh, uh, features in the new simulators, the use of telemetry, for instance, the simulator for training pilots and air traffic controllers, will allow the instructors to detect param parameter accidents that it will be difficult to, to detect during the training session. But also it will be very effective during the debriefing session of, of, of the of the tri of the trike need. And also uh, the simulators are able to record data. And this data is a very val valuable data to understand how the training is being developed. And also, in my opinion, we should be start thinking about what has been done correctly. So to adapt our training session to the best practice of, of the data. So the good performance it will be also a good source of information for, for, for future training programs. As uh, it has been said, uh, uh, other industry uh, domains uh, on the new normal, we need to uh, introduce the use of data. I'm not talking now about the, the, the training of pilots, cabin crew, so the training on other industry areas, the use of data, the use of new technologies, and also the possibility of indiv individual individual training, assuming that not all the people, not all the employees, they learn at the same manner and at the same rate. So this is something that we have to start thinking about in other domains of, of the aviation industry. The use of uh, immersive, uh, as has been explained, immersive technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality, enhance the elements and, and make the training much more effective. So we have the tools, so we have to use the tools in a proper, in, in a proper way. The new training must be blend the requirements and a focus on extent of the, both the individual and the teams and the organizations. Uh, the training of the new normal in aviation must combine competence-based training and with the use of new, new technologies and they will allow to, uh, the students to be immersive in training experiences with the use of uh, virtual learning. This is something that has been also said by, by, my, 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 by my colleagues. Uh, let me finish with something that Captain Bay said yesterday in his presentation. We, we will find a way, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced about that. But let me also, uh, finish with a quotation of Albert Einstein. So we will find a way, but we cannot face today's program with the same level of thinking that we have been created them. So this is something that we need to think about it. So we have to expand our way of thinking and to try to identify what is going to be the best way to improve the training for the new generations and for the new normal. Thank you very much, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jose. Uh, to uh, if effectively engage the next generation, it's crucial to move away from the old generation attitude in aviation. 
Uh, this is for the attracting and the retaining the young talent is essential for the industry's future. So it was a, it's a very uh, precious time for us to think about our future. So it's a, it might be a joke. Yesterday's topic would be a, a clear air turbulence, right? You know every, someone of <laughs> air turbulence. Turbulence, we talk about turbulence many, many times yesterday. Today is a CBTA with new technology on there. So, as uh, my view, we uh, could have find some common view and understanding on the aviation training, uh, aviation uh, personnel training. So, new, tra new training approach must be considered to tackle the uh, numerous challenges in the new normal years. So, uh, with this uh, the methodology by the ensuring the safety. And uh, in the, also, we go to further training should blend competence-based training with the use of the new technology, enabling the immersive experience through the virtual learning platform. This is a, we are living in, 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 the, in the time of the, uh, the new technology years. That's why I like to make comment. I wanted to comment on this one. So it's time's up, and we only have about the six. There's uh, 12 minutes, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, we uh, we have much time to take uh, some questions. So uh, may I ask how to deal with some questions from the? Uh, any questions received from the, by the, you know, oh yeah, not close, just a second please. I got some, yeah, oh yeah, we have question here. So, the question number one is uh, for the, to Eric. Can you read it? Eric? <laughs> yes, yes, I can read it. <laughs> yeah, live by live, live, live learning is, yeah. Yeah, I, so. I, I will read it. I'm, I'm, look, I'm look for the training method to provide more practical training efficiently with less money, burden and stress to the trainee. Is there any model training example applied live wide learning concept? The answer is no. Uh, Lifelong training is more uh, intended training, but I also mentioned lifelong training, sorry, lifelong training is more based on when you change jobs or whatever, or change in regulation and you need training. We call it intentional training. Uh, Life-wide training is more unintentional training. What I mentioned, it can be in your hobby, your passion, you learn. Uh, when you buy a new television, you read the manual, etc. Uh, so it is difficult to plan that. So I would say when it is in your career, uh, when you need to add skills or new competencies, et cetera, et cetera, we call it in, uh, intentional training course. And that is not under the concept life wide. Uh, I combined it and uh, I only mentioned it because we are focusing on training courses going to a school. The only message is that the whole day long we are learning. Also today, listening to my uh, other uh, presenters. I learn from their presentation. I, I learn from every discussion I have. That is what we mean with life wide. And it is a combination about life wide and life long, intentional and not intentional. But um, the question with less money and burden stress to the trainee. Yeah, it, uh, it's a question I cannot direct answer, but uh, with all the modern technologies, and, and I see more and more a trend to personal training. Uh, in the past, when you need to participate in a five-day training course, a standard thing with modern technologies, uh, mobile learning, uh, 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 online training courses, modules, et cetera, et cetera, uh, learning can be more and more effective. In a previous uh, symposium, was also asked about how to learn. Um, I'm from the older generations. I'm not 70 plus, I'm 60 plus. So, but I have also an experience when I was young. I, le uh, I need to learn everything by head, by memory. Nowadays, the internet is there. 
So now younger generations, and also I will learn more where to find it, how to use it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything are are changing, and I think also in the future about mobile learning, uh, uh, micro learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that could be an answer uh, to train efficiently, effectively, less money, and also that's uh, burden stress. At this moment when you need the knowledge, you can find it in a minute on the internet when you know the way. It's more focusing on find the way to find that information at the moment you need and also learn to how to interpret it at the moment you need. Is the answer, sorry, is the question answered? I don't know who... Uh... I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> okay. yeah, must be, must be. So before I go taking the next uh, questions, I'd like to ask your uh, full understanding of, for Ms. Uh, Dr. Laura. Uh, so, the smart she has, she has to leave now for the, her tight schedule, so she has to take a flight, and uh, I'm sorry, to, we, she has to leave, and we, let's uh, give uh, her big hands. Thank you very much. Okay, the, can you move on to the next questions? No, not anymore? Is it all right? So, yes, please. Oh, yes, please, go ahead, I'm sorry, yeah. Hello, sorry, it's just to apologize because I have to run to the airport, but if there are any questions for me, please feel free to forward to the organizers and they will be forwarded to me and I will answer. Thank you and um, apologies again. Thank you. So now uh, let's give it the opportunity for the audience, uh, the participant today. Uh, so if you have any other questions, please uh, raise your hands. So Captain, uh, I'm sorry, the Captain Kim, you raise your hands before, right? Please. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Pei Kang Wen. <laughs> I think I had a lot of turbulence issue yesterday. And I'm working for the Korea as a director of the safety and um, uh, secret investigation. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the Mr. Park and uh, giving me a chance to uh, opportunity to ask a question to the people. And then uh, there was a very good presentation. And then uh, I had a one commonality from the presenter saying, as Mr. Park uh, pointed out, uh, training and the CBT. CBT, CBT. To me, CBT is um, not a new thing. Actually, even for the traditional training, uh, somehow is a CBT, competence based by technical base. The moving on to nowadays, it's, um, I think in the market, uh, AQP has come along, followed by the EBT. Um, my question, first question, actually uh, goes to the Miss um, uh, Rora Kamastra. Uh, <laughs> the, if she may, uh, do they have any statistics, may ICAO have any statistic of um, those um, 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 regulatory body or um, state regulator. Um, how many of those um, the uh, regulator have uh, got involved with the uh, EBT training forms? Do they have any statistics? That's my number one question. Number two question go to um, Mr. Rackett. Um, AQP, I think, is bigger than us, um, maybe EBT, or it's a bigger category to uh, make it happen. And um, another statistic, how many of um, uh, United States carrier, including a Canadian carrier, uh, get the certification of AQP? Another one is um, that um, has FAA ever considered to uh, implement an EBT? And the last one is uh, to the uh, Captain Fernandez that uh, you uh, made a very good point about the new generation uh, education and training. And um, very often we heard the term from uh, your generation, not my generation, uh, uh, expecting new generation kind of um, low discipline. I don't know whether you can agree with that. But 
as you point out, this is not a low discipline. It's a, just a difference. And then you come out with a, a very good point of uh, our future plan uh, to engage with the new generation. And then Ayata, I think it's a, just a, a basic uh, pictures, blueprints, uh, how was, uh, we are going forward. But uh, do you have any uh, practical, practical, uh, what can I say, um, more deeper understanding study of this uh, issue? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Captain Khan. Uh, first of all, thank you for your the, the, uh, good uh, questions to the, our the, uh, pre presenters and speakers today. I'm sorry, but I uh, she cannot take the, uh, your questions, uh, first question, so I will relay the, your questions to the ICAOs uh, when I come back to the Montreal. <laughs> thank you. And the second one is about the, is, uh, is the same question, almost the same question with number one, but in the relating to the Canada and the, in the United States. Would you please uh, take care of this one, Robert? Sure. Yeah. Th thanks, and thanks for the captain question, uh, the questions, Captain Bay. I think the second and the third question, the third question specifically about EBT as well. I'd like to um, ask Ben to answer both of those questions. He is our absolute subject matter expert on AQP. The one comment I would like to make um, at the beginning that I think when we talk about training programs, just as an industry, some of, the, some of the things that concern me that I don't hear goes back to if anybody's ever been a flight instructor in the room, right? we, we teach and, and, and instruct that different people learn different ways, right? And one of the challenges I think we have as an industry is we try and build uh, a, a training model that's kind of this one size fits all. You bring somebody in, they'll go through this training program, um, and, and you'll have that expected result on the on the backside. I think one of the next steps, maybe more strategically, is to be is is that dive in to look at that actual learner and and recognize that people learn in different ways, and that incorporating some of those very basic philosophies that we incorporated right in our early days as flight instructors, et cetera, are still valid today um, and can help improve that, that training cycle with a carrier. But as far as the specifics on the number and, and how we look at uh, evidence-based training, I'd like to turn the floor over to Ben. Were you able to hear the, the questions, Ben? There's, well, we're waiting for your uh, sound to come through. We can see you talking, Ben, but we're not hearing. Uh, is there anybody on the, with the staff? We can see them talking, but we're not hearing on the virtual. How about now? There you go. All Thanks, right. Ben. New technology era, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, well, good, good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Lafargue. I'm working with, uh, with Robert. Uh, thank you for the questions that were asked. The first question, the way I understood it, was, is AQP bigger than EBT? Um, I would answer in a different way. I would say AQP is probably older than AQP, than uh, EBT. AQP started about 30 years ago when big airlines in the United States realized that the traditional methods of training and checking was not supporting really their needs operationally and specifically about their demographics. They approached the FAA and uh, through a very cooperative um, uh, work over several years, actually, AQP came about. So AQP is an old program uh, that mainly was designed for let's say, bigger airline, major airlines initially. And over time, obviously, everybody saw the benefits of AQP and the results, both FAA and industry. And, and uh, now, today, we have roughly 60 air carriers uh, operating under Part 121. And we have 29 AQP programs for pilots. Those 29 programs, roughly half, represent, just like Robert said, 90% of the population of pilots operating under Part 121. So it's a massive success over the previous uh, 30 years. And, and we see this expanding because the data analysis, the data collection, data analysis, and the ability to obtain a flexibility from the regulatory uh, framework 
allows the carriers to really cater their training to their specific need. And, and that's, that's the great success of, of AQP. Now, when we talk about AQP, EBT, CBTA, enhanced TBT, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what alphabet combination you're using. It's all about competencies. It's a matter of how you define the competencies. And at the end of the day, it is a better trained and checked pilot, which means safer skies for everybody. That's what we as regulators are looking for, but of course, that's what also the public is looking for. So that's, that would be a to answer question number one, and number two for that matter. Uh, so roughly 60 carriers in 121, half of them in AQP representing 90% of the powder population. Is the FA and the United States contemplating implementing EBT? Um, you know, we, we are always open to suggestions. Nobody really has jumped on the, on the bandwagon yet and, and, and proposed to us an EBT program, a pure EBT program. Uh, however, we're starting to have many conversations about um, adaptive recurrent training, for example, for a certain type of operation, Part 135, under the standardized curriculum, which is not called EBT, but it really resembles EBT. You have the competencies, your eight or nine uh, main competencies. You have the, the trend to proficiency aspect of it. And, and it's not called EBT, but it's pretty much EBT. And I would leave it at that. Robert, back to you. Th thanks, Ben. And Captain Bay, I hope that um, answered your question. I would just want to add one little piece of clarity, which is something we haven't talked about this week. And again, please feel free to find me and talk about it. But it's um, a, a recent effort that we have in the FAA called standardized curriculum. And what standardized curriculum is, is a, a standardized methodology where the FAA has partnered with industry to develop air carrier training programs in the Part 135 environment. Um, I think, I believe, um, two months ago, maybe three, we first published our first uh, standardized curriculum for the Gulfstream G5 um, aircraft, and we have a number of other um, standardized curriculums in development. The idea of standardized curriculum being um, an air carrier under Part 135 would be authorized to use that standardized sure. curriculum, and then when they would contract with a Part 142 training center, because they're under that standardized curriculum, that Part 142 training center would also be qualified under that curriculum. We would remove the majority of the requirements for differences training. The 142 would provide a, a cadre of instructors and Czech airmen that are qualified across the standardized curriculum versus the, uh, the place we are today, which is, for example, 15 different operators with Gulfstream G5s with 15 different sets of differences training, 15 letters as contract check airmen, 15 observation requirements, et cetera. And it's really a way in our, which these are air carriers, right? Where they're just, um, you know, more of the, uh, what we, uh, I'd put in a more of a global term, your corporate type business jet operators into this standardized curriculum uh, environment. We have that published um, on our FA dynamic regulatory system where it can be reviewed. And we also have our schedule, um, which I believe uh, the Hawker 800 is the next aircraft and then the Citation 560. We're including helicopters, S-76, other aircraft as well in the schedules um, posted. And it's a huge success for us organizationally from a collaborative perspective with industry. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben, from the United States, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, we could communicate uh, in far distance, so we could uh, find uh, some new technology huh? working on the uh, between us. So we feel that we should feel some pressure for the next generation. So we have to change some attitude to the new generation training on this the, here in in Seoul, Korea. So. We'd like to take uh, one more question, I think, so because we have to wrap up the, this. Oh, this, I'm, I'm sorry. Let, let me answer to Captain Bay. Um, well, I, there are a lot of behavioral differences between generations, a lot. Some, some of them are good, some of them are bad. But what I would like to try to highlight is some of the strengths of the new generation. For instance, as I said, they are very 
good visual learner. They have a good uh, resistance to frustration when they interact with technology. So this is a good uh, strength. Baby boomers, we are, are workaholic. We, this, this kind of generation, they, they want to have the, the uh, clear, um, let's say, limit in, in the working time and the free time. So there are, there are many, many different behaviors. And regarding Guayayata, yes, we have a dedicated uh, CBTA uh, team in Montreal that they, they uh, develop courses and training and consulting for those airlines and uh, groups of people that they want to implement CBTA. So we have courses for CBTA in ground operation, for dangerous goods, so we have a, a lot of a, a bunch of products. And, and, and so, yes. Thank you, Fernandez. I wrote, shut it out here and I forgot it. That's my problem now, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I also had a I had uh, my question to the Laura here, but it is about the, uh, as uh, you know, the CBTA uh, and the implementation of CBTA to the licensing. And now which is not ready for the implementation yet, but uh, there are some confusion for the implementation in the state member state there. So I need to ask her to clarify on this one, but uh, I'm, I couldn't do it there later maybe. So we uh, have a time constraint on it. It's already a uh, fast time. So we can take uh, just uh, one more question because there's uh, a guy who uh, raised uh, your hands. Who's there, guys? Put the... Okay, please. Just the one, last one. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Min Su Kim, working for Asiana Airlines, uh, flight crew operation department. Uh, actually, I'm kind of a uh, Z generation, uh, 30s. I have a question for the Captain Jose Fernandez de la Morena. Uh, Asiana Airline is applying the CBTA uh, following the standards of IOSA. And today I noticed the numerous data is collected from the simulator training and my question is, how does collected data can be used for the feedback on the future training for the trainees? Well, the airlines and the industry, we are very rich on data. We have a lot of sources of data. Some of them has been explained today, like in the presentation of the FA, like voluntary safety reports, but we have also quality uh, audit uh, report, maintenance reports, uh, uh, for Guadata, we have a lot of data. Our our problem usually because all the all that lines they have limited resources is our ability to analyze the data. So uh, the key, in my opinion, is to uh, decide what kind of data you need to improve your your training continuous improvement of, of your training. Nowadays, the technology offers you new possibilities, as I said. So you can record simulator sessions. You can use telemetry in the simulator sessions, as, as I mentioned. You can use virtual reality as well, and then to monitor how was the performed the training in other areas. So this is another additional sources of data. So it's difficult to reach the, let's say, break a point, because as I said, there are a lot of data, but the selection process of the data is the key element. So this is something that I, I need, you need to find. I mean, it's not easy. Thank you, Jose. So uh, I'd like to uh, the wrap up the, our the session uh, here now. So I'd like to ask you, all of you, to the, uh, so show your the heartfelt appreciation to the, our the speakers here. And uh, I'd like to uh, finish the, all the session here. So thank you very much, all of you. Uh, please enjoy the break time. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you very much. And uh, with that, we're going to close session four, where we were able to discuss the diverse training methods. Yes, as mentioned, we're going to take a break from now until 11.05. There's coffee and refreshments prepared outside, so please enjoy and be back at this room before we start, as we are to start our next session at 11.05. Thank you very much.